Stanley Kubrick spent most of his life with a camera. Unlike some notable film directors, Kubrick was obsessed, not just with his work, but also with the tools of his trade. Like a blacksmith using the perfect hammer and anvil. One of his favorites throughout his career was the Aeroflex 35 II, a marvel of engineering and durability, yet amazingly simple and easy to maintain. This camera was introduced in 1932, shown at the World Fair by Arnold and Richter, who called it the Aeroflex 35. It was remarkably innovative, using a spinning mirror that not only allowed the user to see exactly what he was filming, but also acted as the shutter, exposing 24 frames each second. The camera was lightweight and could be conveniently carried by a single person. Used by the Germans in World War II, the Airy factory was destroyed by the Allies. After the war, the company redesigned some elements of the camera, calling it the Aeroflex 35 II. In the 1950s, the camera was redesigned again, introducing an improved film transport system for steadier pictures and enhanced reliability. This model was deemed the 35 IIb. Although the Airy 35 II was a common sight on film sets in Europe, it was not used extensively in the U.S. until the 1960s. Although the camera made pretty much noise, it could be used for shots that didn't require synchronized sound recording. It was small, portable, and could even be handheld. Kubrick operated an Airy 35 with a telephoto lens for the long tracking shots during the assault on the anthill in Pass of Glory. In 1963, Kubrick again used the Airy 35 II extensively in Dr. Strangelove. Virtually all the interior bombing scenes were shot handheld with the Airy. Although some of the dialogue may have been dubbed due to camera noise, if you listen carefully, you can sometimes hear the camera whirring in the background on short sound takes. He also used the Airy to shoot the Army assault on Burpleson Air Base, giving it a novel, realistic, you-are-there momentum. In 1964, Ari introduced the final 35-2 version, and its most popular, the 35-2C. Over the years, I've owned and collected Ari 35-2C parts, finally realizing that I had enough to put together another camera. The unit is amazingly simple and robust. Everything is gear-driven. Virtually no springs and no belts. Except for a couple measurement instruments, nothing is required for servicing other than basic tools. It is, however, a precision instrument. I don't know if my creation will work that well. I've tried to choose parts that have the least amount of wear and play. I'd have to do a film test to check the stability of the image. Many of the important tolerances were built in by the factory, like back focus distance for the lens and exact frame line positioning. The only maintenance required of the user is a bit of grease and oil every couple of thousand feet. I think most of these parts came from the same camera, so I might get lucky. By the mid-1960s, Hollywood was starting to take notice. The Airy 2C introduced brighter, larger finder optics on the door. The viewfinder ground glass is removable and easy to change on set. This is a 400-foot magazine, which holds about four and a half minutes of 35-millimeter film. Of course, all of this film loading must be done in complete darkness. The finder door comes completely off, allowing the film gate to be opened and the film threaded inside. A single claw both pulls down and registers the film for exposure. To get a little technical, these cameras did not have a registration pen that locked the film in place during exposure, ensuring a steady, sharp picture. Instead, Ari devised a cam system that moved the claw so that after it pulled the film down for exposure, it gently dwelled for a split second, ensuring the film was accurately placed for exposure. By not using a registration pen, Ari could achieve a remarkably light and simple design. The standard Ari 35 IIc has a turret like this, 
allowing up to three lenses to be used in quick succession, usually a wide, medium, and telephoto. The motor could also serve as a hand grip. It was completely removable, allowing for both sync motors for sound and slow motion, high speed motors. To make the camera more convenient for tripod use, third party companies like Cine60 developed a flat base, a fixture which allowed the motor to be vertically mounted beside the camera, thereby providing a flat surface for mounting. The ARRI 35-2C soon became a standard B camera on virtually every Hollywood set. The easy setup and handheld capability met the somewhat crazy aesthetic of 1960s movie making. From Star Trek the TV show to Easy Rider, the camera could be used in almost any configuration, making shots that would have been difficult or impossible now routine. In the 1950s, ARRI introduced a sound blimp, a heavy lead-lined enclosure that made the camera almost as quiet as the Hollywood Mitchell used for decades. Even with the heavy blimp, the ARRI was still significantly lighter and smaller than the Mitchell camera. In the 1960s, a German company called Cine60 developed an even lighter fiberglass blimp for the camera. Used with a sound sync motor, the flat base could be inserted into a blimp, allowing the ARRI 35 to be used as the A camera for sync sound shooting. The key to making a blimp as quiet as possible is to insulate the camera with sound absorbing rubber fasteners. I got this Cine60 blimp on eBay. It was in pretty rough condition, and I had to reline the interior covering and modify the electronics. It came with a special finder door for the 2C that had rubber couplings built in to keep noise from transferring to the outside of the camera. I actually shot a feature film in the late 1990s with a 2C in one of these blimps. It worked pretty well, but it's not nearly as quiet as the heavy ARRI Studio blimp. Cine60 always said it was a location blimp, meaning it would be used outside or in locations with some ambient sound. I have to agree. Just to compare, the ARRI 2C fully loaded in this blimp weighs about 39 pounds, and the Arriflex 35BL, which was to replace all this in the mid-1970s with a self-blimped camera, weighed about 25 pounds. In the 1970s, Hubert chose a clockwork orange as his next picture. He would shoot virtually the entire film on location, as opposed to 2001, which was shot almost entirely in studio. Working with a budget of $2 million, on the low side even back then, he would also lens Clockwork Orange in 35mm, as opposed to the 65mm he used in 2001. Wanting to use a small, fast-moving crew shooting on location in and around London, Kubrick would use the 35-2C for a large part of this feature. In addition to a Mitchell 35mm studio camera for long takes, Kubrick also used an ARRI 35-2C in a heavy studio blimp, and he used the innovative Cine60 fiberglass blimp for the first time. In many ways at that point in time, the ARRI 35-2C made films like Clockwork Orange possible. Likewise, there are many other examples of the camera contributing to movie-making history, including The French Connection, Bullet, American Graffiti, Easy Rider, and more. Ari sold thousands of Araflex 35s, something like 14,000 as far as I know. With the introduction of the 35BL, a silent 35mm reflex sound camera, in 1973, the 2C was used mostly as a B camera for extra or difficult shots. ARRI eventually replaced the 35-2 with the 35-3 in 1979. The 35-3 had a registration pin for film stability, as well as built-in sophisticated electronics and a crystal-controlled motor. Kubrick continued to use his 35-2Cs, which he personally owned, 
at least through Full Metal Jacket. Although he never used the 2C for sound takes after Clockwork Orange, he still used the camera for handheld or B-camera shooting. To this day, many film enthusiasts are still using this camera. It's basic design, almost 100 years old. <laughs>